Hello back again. Um, I'm very happy to welcome today Jens Meyer from MH Acoustics. So if you get into spherical microphone arrays or ambisonics recordings and the very first papers on closed sphere, closed shell, spherical microphone arrays and how to construct them and how to do it mathematically correct that you get a nice ambisonic signal out of them, you find two names, Gary Elko and Jens Meyer. And since then, the produce of um, this very beautiful microphone array, which is called the Eigenmic, and he even brought one, which is very well engineered. So the only thing you do, you have a little box, you put in an Ethernet cable. It's all amplified, uh, powered over Ethernet, so you can have long distances. And I think it's the only so far pro audio accepted microphone array from sound engineers. And as you'll see now, <laughs> um, so I present Jens and the Eigen mic. Um, <laughs> you can do it. Uh, but don't keep it, yeah? <laughs> because, because it's, because it it's mine. It does not go through the exit. <laughs> it doesn't go out the exit. And he will talk a little bit about the technology behind uh, what you should understand when you work with Eigen mics. You should understand something about mathematics. Um, but I think it, he'll explain it to you in a way that uh, even when you're not dealing with mathematics, you get the basics. And then we have some beautiful examples to listen here um, over the speaker dome. And so, yeah, welcome. Okay. Well, thank you for this nice introduction, Marcus. Um, yeah, I think there's not much left to say in terms of the, the Eigen mic. Um, maybe a little bit on MH Acoustics. We are really a small company. We're six people, all engineers. Um, no, no artists, no sound engineers. So we rely on feedback we get from, from you guys um, to, to know what we have to do to make things better. The talk, higher order ambisonic microphones from theory to application. So this is what I thought I would talk about. It will be very different from the talks I've seen here yesterday and today. Not sure what you've heard on, on Monday or Tuesday, but you will have to endure half an hour of, of theory, which will be the underlying technology, what is an ambisonic microphone, which might have been covered a little bit. Um, I will explain the physical limitations that you run into. This will help you to, to see to explain artifacts you might come across. So like Marcus was saying, like, don't give up. There is like, there are some non-ideal behaviors, um, but, but you should know them and then you can deal with them. Yeah, what, what other uses are there for ambisonic microphones? It's, it's very universal. Okay, so that's the half, first half hour theory. And then the next half hour, will be a little bit more, more practical. I will show lots of pictures, um, some technical specifications, and go over those. And then there will be a good half hour of listening to some recordings, some raw recordings, some edited recordings, a little bit of everything. And since we're a small group, I enjoyed the way it happened the last two days that if there are questions, don't hesitate to, to bring them up so we don't let them linger. Okay, so what is an abisonic microphone? If you look at the spatial properties, we can maybe divide microphone, microphone setups into three general groups. There's group number one, which is the regular microphone which is just a single microphone that you put somewhere in space, an omnidirectional microphone. It will record the pressure at this position in space. And so this is what you will end up with. And then later in your studio, you will know what the pressure was in this point, but you will not know what, what happened over here or, or back there. And there's no spatial information to it either. You will, don't know where this was 
based on what you recorded. In your post-processing, of course, you can do stereo panning to give it to give it some spatial information. But this spatial information is really your artistic freedom that you that you put in. You wanted to have the source coming from the left or from the right or wherever you place it. Then there's the second group, which is the multi-microphone configuration, where you have, for example, a stereo pair, or you go surround. Everybody has their own favorite setup for surround setups. So this will end up being a, a channel-based system where you record for 5.1, and then your recording will be fairly specific to a 5.1 playback. Or now 7.1, 9, whatever you, you can think of. And there's lots of spatial information in this one, but again, it's limited to what you recorded. You recorded your stereo this way, so you don't really know what's, what's behind you. So you. You made it for a purpose, and that's good, but that's what it is. And then we have the third category, which is the ambisonic microphone. And here, we really try to record a sound field. So you place your ambisonic microphone somewhere, and now you're actually not only recording the information that's at the point of the sphere, but you're recording all the information in its surrounding. So when you have this recording, you can later figure out what was the sound pressure here, or what was the sound pressure back here. You can go into the sound field and, and look into different directions. Yeah, and that's why I put there, the big advantage here is it's agnostic to the playback system. So you can still, if you have your ambisonic mic here and you have a dominant source here, you can then later on go into your sound field and just focus on this one sound source, extract this one sound source out of your sound field, and you basically are back to 2.1, where you have a single mic. So you're very flexible with what you, what you have in your recording. You can extract sound fields, or you can extract sources. You can extract multiple sources, going back to point 0.2. So you can do a 5.1 with the information you have of your sound field, for example. Good. But now the question is, how do we do this? How do we record with a microphone here? How do we record all the information that's that's around it. We got some help from the field of theoretical acoustics. There is something called the kirchhoff helmholtz integral equation, which yeah, speaker is, <laughs> is at the most unfortunate location. So behind the speaker, there is a, there's another pressure and a, a vector normal to the surface. And so if we know the pressure and the surface differential, which essentially is the velocity, sound velocity on a closed surface. That is all we need, and that determines the sound pressure inside that volume and outside of that volume. So basically, with that knowledge, all we need to do is measure the sound pressure and the velocity on a closed surface. And the most simple surface, closed surface out there is a sphere. So. You can do an obloid spheroid, which is like a disc. You can do a prolite spheroid, which is like a soccer ball. Solutions exist for those configurations as well, but the sphere is just, it weights all direction equally. It's the easiest solution. So that's why ambisonic went with the sphere. And here are two examples of ambisonic microphones. And they show the two principles that are employed. Left one is the sound field microphone, which is around since the 70s. It's a first order ambisonic microphone. And what they did essentially is put cardioid sensors on a, on a virtual surface. So you still have a sphere there, a virtual sphere. And then on this virtual sphere, you have four cardioid sensors. And a cardioid, as you probably know is the combination of a pressure sensor and a velocity sensor. And so with a cardioid sensor, you measure the pressure and the velocity. So 
the sound field measures pressure and velocity on this closed surface. On the right hand side is a different approach <coughs> and that is a, a rigid sphere. And in the rigid sphere, we have embedded pressure sensors. And the advantage we have there with the rigid sphere, we know the, the normal velocity is zero. So we get the velocity for free, we, we know it's zero. So all we have to measure is, is the pressure. And pressure sensors are much easier to, to work with than, than cardioid sensors. There's less variation in sensitivity, less variation in, in directivity, and so they're just, they're less noisy. They're just, yeah, a nicer sensor to work with. And so both of those approaches give us the information we need. And we now should be able to, to use this, this measurement on our surface to record the sound field. Now the next question is, how do we go about getting this sound field information? Can I ask you a question? Yes, please. Very stupid question. No. What's the difference between pressure and velocity? The velocity is basically the, the air movement where you have two, you have a pressure here and a pressure here and they're different, and so you have these air molecules going back and forth. They also have a direction, which is important, while the pressure is really just a static scalar value that's at one point in space. Can I have a choice? Yeah. So this is like a multiple small pressures on microphones in one kind of a spherical capsule, is that correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Those are the right, the left one. Yeah, there are four individual microphones putting together, and on the right one, there are thirty-two, micro, thirty-two microphones forming one microphone essentially. Thirty-two capsules, microphone capsules forming one, one microphone. So, this is the only equation that I will show. Um, and you might have seen this one, actually. I don't know if, if Marcus showed it on Monday or so. That's kind of the fundamental of, of ambisonics. So what ambisonics is built on is the idea that every sound field can be broken up in spherical harmonic components. So any pressure at location in spherical coordinates with a certain frequency, k, can be expressed as a infinite sum of, of these terms there. And then that's just the idea. And then you have your spherical harmonics and then all you need to know to define your, your sound field are these coefficients a and m. You know your spherical harmonics, you know your spherical Bessel functions, those are two, two known components. The only unknown there are your coefficients a and m, which are your ambisonic signals. And so if you define your A and M's, then you uniquely define your sound field. And maybe an example makes it a little bit more clear. There is a plane wave coming from, from X direction. And to define those plane waves, if you use these coefficients on your left-hand side and would we'll plug them up into these, this equation up there, that would define your, your plane wave. This is only up to second order. There's like third, fourth, you have to go pretty long. But the idea here really is we need to get access to these coefficients and then you know your sound field. For the ambisonic playback, it's, it's the opposite. You basically define your coefficients and then you define your plane wave or you define your sound field we now have to deal the other way. We have a sound field and we want to find the coefficients. And so we find these coefficients by extracting these spherical harmonic terms. And this is, yeah, you've seen this one, I'm sure. These are the spherical harmonic um, coefficients plotted in forms of, of beam patterns. And so to find these coefficients, it turns out that all we have to do is we have to use a microphone 
that has the directivity pattern of the particular coefficient. So for example, if you want to find the, the coefficient that corresponds to the y0,0, zero, zero, we have to use an omnidirectional microphone. And then the output of that microphone would be proportional to, to that a and m, this a0,0 zero, zero coefficient. The same is true for the first order ones. If we have a dipole in, in z direction, we would have a, a microphone that is a dipole pattern or figure eight pattern, hold it into z direction. The output of that microphone would be equivalent or would correspond to this coefficient a10. And so now what we do with our with our microphones on these on the, with the capsules on the sphere is you basically combine those those capsules to to form those patterns. Like it's easier to understand with the if you have the four cardioid patterns, if we add all four cardioid patterns up, or four patterns or four capsules, um, they turn out to have an omnidirectional characteristic. So that would be our W component or a a zero zero component. If we add the two on one side and subtract the two on the other side, we have one of these dipole coefficients. And then if you go beyond first order, it just gets more and more complicated. You need more and more degrees of freedom to actually combine the patterns in a smart way that gives you access to those coefficients. But that's the fundamental idea. And I know that that was a lot to digest. But I hope you got a little bit of an idea of what's behind all this. Jan, when you say you need degrees of freedom in the last thing that you said, with what, what do you need degrees of freedom from? Uh, well, for example, if you want to go, if you want to, let's say you want to record all, you want to build a microphone that records second order ambisonics. So you would have to provide a microphone array, means a configuration of, of capsules that would be able to create those first nine patterns. And in order to create nine different patterns, you can imagine the minimum number of capsules, the minimum number of degree you need is nine. So that tells you right there that if you want to create a microphone, a second order ambisonic microphone, you need at least nine capsules on your surface to be able to mathematically describe these nine different patterns. And so that's why, for example, our microphone has 32 capsules. So we see third order, we need, we start with index zero, that makes it a little bit confusing. So for third order, we need 16 degrees of freedom to form these patterns. And if we want to do fourth order, we would need 25. And then it just gets 36, 49. Yeah, it it goes, goes up quickly. <laughs> so may I ask, yeah. you said there are 39 capsules on the icon? 32. 32. 32. So then you're not matching perfectly uh, the counts of one of the integers for orders of the sphere of harmonics, are you then able to use the additional capsules that you have? I mean, so do you have an equidistribution on the sphere of your capsules? And then are you able to gain additional precision from, uh, what, what's the mapping like from the Yeah, from the you're right. We, we, do, we do gain. We do gain by having some more. If you, if you do a critical, yeah, I guess you can say critical sampling, if you would have 20 degrees, 25 degrees of freedom, or let's say 16 capsules, 16 degrees of freedom for 16 um, so patterns, that gets really, yeah. Are you using like a fractional? Are you, is the, are, you, are you using fractional spherical harmonics or something like that? No. No, we really just get these 25 circular harmonics up to fourth order, and the additional seven capsules just, just help us to, to make it easier to, to figure out how to combine them. Actually, this is what I was saying in between time and frequency sampling, that we do regular temporal sampling, we go to frequency domain with a Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. So 
for regular sampling of the sphere is a problem on its own. So it's a quadrature of the sphere. Mm -hmm. And so when you critically sample, there are only few sampling grids, which are tricky to define, which allow you to use exactly the number of microphones um, to mm -hmm. encode your something into a certain amount. And otherwise it gets badly conditioned mm -hmm. and you run into numerical instability. By adding some more microphones, some more degrees of freedom, you don't have to do, go to partial sphere harmonics, which do exist, but it's a pain to use them. But it's regular days, it's just your encoding matrix. You just add some redundancy. So. Yeah. yeah, so to say. Yeah. And just the subject of uniquely or not uniformly sampling the sphere, it, it's a big topic. It's, it's, it's not a trivial task. Yeah. Each, there are regular capsules that you will find in, in vocal mics as well. So each capsule is really from a few hertz, 10 hertz or so, up to beyond 20 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. You don't call it XLR, right? This is an internet. This is an internet, ethernet, ethernet. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which once again is beautiful thing that it's powered over the internet. So you only have to run one cable to use the microphone. And I think in terms of engineering, it's something which is really beautiful mm -hmm. because when you're a sound engineer and you hang a microphone in a huge concert hall from the ceiling, um, it changes a lot if it's a single ethernet cable or if you have to run power cables over balconies and whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's really a beautiful thing. And so that was actually, uh, this was built and designed in like 2005, 2000 five to seven time frame. And 32 channels was not a, a common thing back then. So we really had to think about what protocol to use and what connectors and stuff. So that sphere of 32 capsule, how does it see different frequencies? Okay, a low frequency versus a high frequency, right? I mean, low frequencies are gonna have a different way of impacting that sphere than high frequency. Yes. Well. Yeah. We get to this in detail. Yeah, so that's basically what what we end up with. We have our sphere with some distrib sensor distributions on a, on a spherical surface, be it a virtual surface or be it a rigid sphere. Then we have to come up with some processing to map those sensor signals into our ambisonic signal. So in ambisonic language, I guess, we go from A format through an encoder to B format. And so in the process from A to B, we will lose a few things based on physical limitations. And so here we go back to your question now. The first one we have to overcome, when you remember this equation, we had the spherical harmonics, we had our coefficients a and m, and we had the spherical Bessel function. So when we measure our spherical harmonics, the signal that comes out of the array is the product of this spherical Bessel function and the coefficient a and m. So we have to separate a and m and the spherical Bessel function. And we do this, this is what the spherical Bessel functions look like on, on the left-hand side. It's basically the frequency response of our, of our ambisonic output. Not the ambisonic output, of, the, of, the, of an intermediate stage after the beam former, basically. And we have to compensate for this so that we are just left with the, with the coefficients a and m, so that all the different spherical harmonics are on the same footing. And so if we have an open sphere with pressure sensors, we see that at low frequencies, we have just a zero order um, component. Then at some frequency, the first order kicks in, second order, third order. They all go with 6 dB per, per octave or 6 n dB. So that's 6 dB, 12 dB, 18 dB. Coming back to your question regarding that low frequencies, high frequencies, you can imagine that at low frequencies, your wavelength is huge. And you have this little sphere in there. So the pressure variation over the sphere 
is, is minimal. So it's basically an omni. And, and this is what we see here. And then once your wavelength shrinks, the spatial variation over your spherical aperture gets, gets more intense and more intense. So you get more and more spatial information in there, which shows us that we get more and more, we get higher and higher orders. With every order, we get more spatial detail. That's how they translate. But we also see one problem with the open sphere and pressure sensors here, and that is that they go through zeros. So at that frequency here, we would have no idea actually what our coefficient for the zero order would, would be. If we have velocity sensors, same thing, they go through zeros. And remember early on what we said, we need to measure pressure and velocity. And so if we combine the pressure and the velocity, we see that the zero in the one actually corresponds to a maximum in the other one. So if we combine the two, we actually do get access to all of those coefficients again. And then there is the beauty of using the, the rigid sphere with the velocity being zero. So we only need the pressure and that's reflected here. There are no zeros. They all have kind of the same 60 B per octave um, low pass behavior. And again, zero order down to DC, first order coming up with first order, high pass, second order, third order, and so on. And I should say that there's a frequency scale here, and that's valid for a sphere of radius 42 millimeters, which is the eigenmic. Now, what I said, was saying, like, this is basically what comes out of, of our beamformer. If we just have a beamform with a, with a pattern of, of these um, spherical harmonics, and we need to compensate for, for those. So that means we have to convolve with the inverse of this frequency. And so this would be the inverse for the, for the rigid sphere. And well, we see trouble. You know, we see that there's lots of gain required to compensate for, for the higher orders. And that's just practically not possible to, to do. Because we're not amplifying the, the signal only, we also amplify the noise. And eventually, you, you're just left with, with noise. And so what we have to do is we have to limit the gain. So we basically choose a maximum gain. 40 dB is about as much as you can tolerate. So you, you cut off the gain here, which means you will not be able to use your second order below 400 hertz, for example. And you will not be able to use your third order below one kilohertz. That's what you have to give up. Do you understand the noise floor issue in terms of that's a product of amplification and about yeah. Minimizing noise and it's it's correct. Like you put in like thirty. In this very specific example here, you would put in more than thirty dB of gain into one of your in your first into your first order ambisonic signals, and that's you will hear this. There is definitely the first order at low frequency. You, it's it's noisier than than your zero order at, at low frequency. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And so this is basically what you will end up with, what I was saying earlier. Like you cut off your gain at one point, which means below this cutoff, you won't be able to use this particular mode. So the second order is cut off at 400 hertz, the third order at one kilohertz, fourth order at two kilohertz, and so on. And this cut -off these cutoff frequencies as we saw earlier, really depend on the maximum gain you allow. Like if you want to have a, a very quiet system, you might cut off a 10 dB, for example, which means that even your first order now only goes to eight, 800 hertz. 10 dB might be extreme. You might 
20 dB, for example. So, but still, your first order only goes to like 200 hertz, which I think is not a real problem. If you look at regular cardioid microphones, they, they also have a, a roll off at, at low frequencies. They have, they're naturally noisy at low frequencies. Same thing there. So it's really just a natural behavior that comes with physics. You, you just have your small aperture, and you're trying to resolve a difference in, in, in phase. And with a wavelength like this, and you want to get a difference in phase, you just get very, very noisy down there. It doesn't matter if it's a spherical microphone or if it's a cardioid microphone capsule. They're always noisy at low frequencies. Another problem that we saw is that in an ideal case, we get access to the pressure on a closed surface. But we saw we don't have the continuous pressure. We just sample the pressure at 32 locations, for example. So with these 32 locations, we can resolve our 25 spherical harmonics. But as soon as there are more than 32 harmonics in the space, which was happening at like, here we have second, third, fourth, fifth, like the sixth order, seventh order kicking in at like eight, kilo, nine, eight kilohertz or so. Those modes we can't resolve anymore. So they will actually then show up in the lower order modes, which is called spatial aliasing. It's the same as frequency or time aliasing. If you, if you have a, if you digitize a sine wave and you get only, get less than two points per, per sine wave, you can't resolve your original frequency anymore. You need at least two sample points per, per wavelength to reconstruct your original frequency. And the same idea here. So once your frequency gets, gets above this, um, you end up with spatial aliasing. And this goes back to a little bit to the, to the earlier question we had regarding we have 32 sensors. Um, so the 32 sensors, the, the little bit of, of extra seven sensors there, um, also gives us a little bit more, uh, pushes the aliasing frequency a little bit out. If you were to do critical sampling, I never tested it, I never plotted it, but I'm sure we would see it earlier. And then the other topic that briefly came up is uniform sampling. Like, how do you uniformly sample a sphere? And there are many different ways you can do this. And there are two that are plotted here. We're actually using a truncated icosahedron, which is the, the classic soccer ball. And then the bottom one is the spherical T design, which is truly the ideal solution to the problem. And that reflects in the spatial aliasing. So how, these plots should be interpreted. Everything that's dark blue is, is perfect, and everything that's not dark blue is, is unwanted aliasing, like higher order terms showing up in lower order terms. May I ask, I know that with the icosahedron, you have mostly six uh, ver vertice faces, but then you have a couple like pentagons as well? Yeah, you have six yeah, pentagons and hexagons. So, but, but the microphones are at the vertices, right? They're at the center of these faces. Okay, so then do you have to, is that, it doesn't matter that you have some hex, hexagons and some pentagons? It's, you can compensate for it. Okay, uh, may I ask how? Yeah, there's something called quadrature coefficients that you can, can include into your, 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 your beamformer part of it. Yeah, but they are so minimal that we didn't put them in actually for a long time. Only last, in the last release when we went to fourth order, we saw a difference. I'm not sure we would hear a difference, but since we saw a difference, we decided to put them in. And so what turns out, if for this like ID spherical T design, yeah, you don't see any, any issues, any aliasing terms in, in, in the lower ACN numbers here. So we only interested up to 25. And so, but we see like aliasing is here. This is zero order, first order, second order, third order, fourth order. So our fifth order will alias, sorry, the, the fifth order 
will alias into third order. Um, while if we use the truncated icosahedron, the first problem we occur is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, is 7 order. So we gain, we gain some extended frequency range before these, these aliasing really kicks in. You basically see the result of this slide later on where I think it becomes more clear. So why is the spherical thing the ideal if the icosahedron yields fewer aliases in the Oh, the, the icosahedron is just the positioning of the sensors. It's still a sphere. It's just that the problem is where to position the sensors on the sphere. And so the icosahedron, the faces of the, the center of the face of the icosahedron, that's basically where the, the microphones were placed. Could you just explain uh, this graph a little bit more? I don't know ACN, and it seems to be the same on both axes. What yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Um, ACN is ambisonic channel number. So the problem in, in, in ambisonics is we have order and degree. So we have y, 2, 3, for example. And so all, all our axes are, are like linear. So we don't really have space for, for 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. So this ambisonic channel number basically means this is y, 0, 0 y1 minus 1, y10, one y11. One one. It's actually a triangle, just... which uh, Jens showed before with the spherical harmonics, mm -hmm. plotted on a linear thing. So each, so in the first one, you see it's got just one coefficient, it's the only direction. But in the second one, you have three coefficients, which are the uh, dipoles. And then, as I told you yesterday or two days ago, it depends how you go through this triangle. So if you start, so the first one is clear because there's just one coefficient, but then you have three coefficients and how you row, how will you put them in a row? Because you can say it's how you see them, but you could also say it's more like X, Y, Z. So yeah, there, yeah. So that's another order of confusion. It's, and it's, it's really, yeah. So okay. this, the ACN is, is one way to, to order your ambisonic signal. So this is how it's done with the ACN one. Or zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and, and so it goes on. There is the first Malham numbering, which is different from this one. So, it, well, W, X, Y, Z. That would be a channel order. And then there is yet a third one, which I think pretty much disappeared, though. I should have disappeared now, yeah. yeah. Which. So ACN is the one which is mostly yeah. often used now. And the same is true. This only shows the, the shape, but there's also a level to them. And we had this, we saw this when Marcus was showing the, the panoramics, the, the scaling. There are four, at least four different scaling options, how you can scale them. So which defines their, their relationship to each other in terms of level. And the problem is if you screw up one of them, it will screw up your output. And what makes it even worse is you might not even realize that it screws up your output because you still get a decent spatial impression, but it's just not as good as it could be or should be. So that's something you're really careful about, the ordering of your ambisonic channels that go into your system and the scaling of your ambisonic channels that go into your system. And the polarity as well, but I think that's also something that's disappeared. So could I just briefly? Yeah. Um, so this is describing where you're deciding to place those channels? This is basically showing the non-ideal behavior of our, of our patterns. Which will then help you decide where? Yeah, which will where to place the sensors. Yeah. yeah, this is a very complicated plot where I was debating to show it or not, and it's, it's hard to, to figure out. But essentially what it says is that our, I should have made another plot where it actually shows you what's happening when this one is overlapping with, with the lower ones. Actually, I what you see is you can represent with the eigenmic four order, so up to order four. Mm -hmm. So the spherical T design is optimal in mathematical sense. So um, up to order four, which gives you the ACN 30 there, yeah. it's dark blue, so everything is fine. 
but outside this region, because the sound field has more orders when you have very high frequencies, you don't stop at order four. You would have a, a frequency band, a uh, low pass filter to say, I get rid of the high frequencies, but then you would have a microphone which sounds like that, which is no good. Um, so that's a spatial aliasing, which, which just is some kind of mislocalization you will introduce. So the T design is optimal to the order the microphone works on, so the fourth order. Um, and then with the additional microphones in the truncated icosia drum, you see you get less optimal for what you represent, but you extend the range of frequencies, of higher frequencies, which you can nice, nicely represent with a microphone. Yeah, yeah so these, these light blue here, they're like minor, minor aliasing terms. And yeah, but we gain, like this is fifth order, where and you see yeah. non-ideal behavior. Here is seventh order non-ideal behavior. And if we translate this to here, so fifth order would be the light blue. So that means we would actually, once these high order terms pop up in the sound field, which is at um, two, three, four, five, six kilohertz, we would get this aliasing. We would see this bleeding of the fifth order term into our lower order terms. Or with a truncated icosahedron, we see this aliasing starting with the order seven, which is actually up here at like eight or nine kilohertz. So we gain two kilohertz um, by compromising a little bit of aliasing in the lower orders, but we gain two kilohertz in the, in the frequency range. And so the last non, so we already had two non id behavior. One was the amplification by compensating for the spherical it's actually for this rigid sphere, it's not the spherical Bessel function, but for this frequency response of these spherical harmonics. And then we saw the spatial aliasing. And then the last one, which is related to the spatial aliasing, is that we are limited in, in order. And so this gives you a little bit of an idea. So this is our sound field, which in an ideal world, we go to infinity. In a practical world, we will all, always be order limited from the recording side and also from the playback side. And so just an example for a simple plane wave to make it a little bit more exciting, this one comes from angle of 20 degrees. This is order infinity, so ideal. This is if we truncate, only use the first, the terms up to order 10, we see a little bit of non-ideal behavior out on the edges and then limit to order five. We only see a good reconstruction in, in the center, but the edges are pretty bad. So this brings up an interesting question that I think is a big topic in the ambisonic world, is so what order do we really need? Is it third order, is it fifth order, is it six, seven, ten? And I don't think the, there's, a, there's an agreed upon answer um, that I'm aware of. You hear many people say seven, but um, I don't know. Do you have an opinion? No, because each time when I think it's enough order that we get nice localization, I add some speakers and get one order high. It's a little bit like with wave field synthesis. Um, you build your first system, which goes up to two kilohertz, and think, hey, it's working, cool. And then you get to the next level, it goes up to four kilohertz, and say, hey, it's even better. And as we heard yesterday or two days ago with the wave field, then you put another array on top of it, you, you reduce it first, say, hey, six kilohertz is quite good. And with ambisonics, it's a little bit the same. You heard, all heard Natasha's piece, which was full seventh order, so it was perfect for the concert hall. And you could hear this clarity of, of the cranes. It was really opening up the sphere. If you hear, if you listen to the same in fourth order, it's not the same space. So in terms of localization, yes, it's the same spatial image. But in terms of clarity in, in, in an acoustic musical sense, it's not the same. So. We know that if we have fourth order, we get accurate localization, at least in a horizontal plane. Um, so there have been a lot of listening experiments which show, OK, mm -hmm. if the sound source comes from there, it's OK. But then there is another term which now more people get into perceptual testing. It's the quality of experience, mm -hmm. which is not linked to this straightforward parameters like, hey, I localize well. You will not listen to music and say, hey, cool, I localize well. Mm -hmm. No, it sounds good or it sounds bad or uh, something's happening. So in terms of distance perception, clarity and whatever, I would say 
even fourth order is not enough. So we wait yeah. for an update of the eigenmate. Yeah. So that's why I said like seven <laughs> order is probably a good sweet spot to be in. Just one before one one thing before I forget. So this one looks really bad, but I think the good thing is that our ear is forgiving and what Marcus is saying, like it really what really counts is, is what we hear. And if we hear a seventh order system and it sounds really good, I think that's all we, we need. So correct me if I'm wrong. So what you're talking about is about localization only. You're not talking about spectral bandwidth. I mean, what happens to 20 hertz and 20, 20 kilohertz? I mean, are you narrow banding the signal or, is, or are you just talking about localization? Um, this is talking about localization. Okay. Yeah, spatial, spatial concept. OK, so now from what we learned in the second few, or the last few slides is that our Encoder in ambisonic terms or eigenbeamformer in beamforming words actually consists of, well, we have our microphones on our spherical surface. We feed them into this encoder. And inside there, we have a beamformer section, which forms our, our spherical harmonics. So we can extract the corresponding signals. And those are followed by an EQ to compensate for this spherical Bessel functions. And then finally, we now get our ambisonic signals, which have a flat frequency response with a low frequency cutoff, which we can vary. Um, and then at the high frequency, we see this aliasing. So now we basically have the full system together. And this is a little summary. So, in terms of um, design factors for a spherical array. Um, we basically have two physical um, design factors. One is the number of elements, and the other one is the diameter. And the number of elements is really determined primarily by the order of the spherical harmonics we want to extract of this from the sound field. And with any order, we get n plus 1 square um, components. And we talked about degrees of freedom. We need at least as many microphones as we have spherical harmonic components. So for, a, let's say, we talked about 7. So for a 7th order microphone, 7 plus 1 square, we need at least 64 microphone capsules on the surface. And that is m plus 7, or is it plus 25%? Uh, so you have m is greater than. Okay, uh, it should, there should be greater equal. Uh, yeah, but um, uh, it will always be seven more, or it will be twenty five percent as many mics. Always. No, it would. It, it's at least sixty four, yeah, and if you can spare a few more, the better you you get away. The diameter, what the di diameter really um, mainly determines actually two things. One is the the low frequency cutoff. The, the bigger your sphere, you can imagine if you have a wavelength and you have your sphere in the center, the, the larger the sphere, the more variation of pressure you have over the sphere. So the easier it will be to extract these, low these components at lower frequencies. So the bigger the sphere, the better your low frequency spatial components. And the better your spatial components at low frequencies. This way I should form it. And then the other thing is, though, that this spatial aliasing essentially kicks in roughly when your average microphone spacing, or you have to keep your average microphone spacing at less than half a wavelength. That's a rule of thumb. Because on a sphere, again, like what's your average distance? It's not easily defined. Um, so if you make your sphere larger and you keep your number of microphone constants, they will move further apart, which means your spatial aliasing will come down. So there's this, this trade-off. If you make your sphere larger, you get better low frequency for performance, but your aliasing comes in earlier, so you lose high frequency performance. If you make your sphere too small, you push your aliasing up, but 
you won't get your higher order harmonics at low frequencies. If you increase the number of capsules on a larger... Uh, that works, yeah. But then again, it's like a square problem. If you, make, if you double your radius, you have to use four times as many capsules to keep your spacing constant. Mm -hmm. Do you think it, it may be reasonable to uh, ever use capsules which do not have identical uh, characteristic frequency responses or gains? And would so doing potentially allow you to relax the orthonormality condition? Could you distribute them in non-uniform arrangements if they were themselves different? You, you can do random arrangements too. Um, that approach has been, has been tested. Um, but there's not much to you. Would, the advantage you will get is your, your aliasing pattern wouldn't be as regular. So that might be an advantage. But um, I think it's just, especially being an engineer, you try to control as much as you can to the degree that you can. Sensitivity of this microphone. Like I understand that we cut the noise, and the encoder, but for example, with the how it works with the preamps actually. Yeah, that's a good question. So all we were talking about here was just looking at the at the processing that comes after the speech or the sound is picked up. So the capsule is completely independent of, of what we talked about here. So yeah, the better your capsule, the the better your your signal. The less the, the less noisy your capsule. The capsules that we use in the in the eigen mic, they have a, a self noise of 15 dB SPL. Just one question: Could you combine different spheres sizes, like a Christmas tree with a big one here, a smaller one? It's mm -hmm. that's another report that has been suggested. So we saw earlier, if you use an open sphere with, um, with pressure sensors, you get these zeros. And so if you use two spheres, concentric spheres with different radii, those zeros will be at different frequencies. So you could switch between those two, two spheres to, to again get your full, full bandwidth. So yeah, that approach has been suggested. Or we were also thinking, of like a closed sphere and then have like some sticks coming out and have microphones on, on, on sticks on the outside like a little porcupine or, or something. Mm -hmm. So you could use your outside sphere for the lower frequencies and then use your, your concentric rigid sphere for the, for the higher frequencies. Yeah. Yeah, there can be tricks can be played there. Uh -huh. And you can show that um with just a few, if you use an open microphone array, so an open sphere which has this ugly resonance is by only putting a few microphones inside in an intelligent way, only a few will stabilize the KAR range to the frequency range up to higher frequencies. Um, it's not yet tested in practice, but on paper, um, mm. this looks very good. Mm. But then there is, how long did it take you to develop the microphone, I guess 10 years? from paper to product? 2001 to, no, five years. Five years, okay, five four, years. Four, five years, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, plus the, what I didn't say is the, the sphere also, um, you gain some SNR for free by, by the diffraction around the sphere. So you get some, some pressure build up in front of the sphere. So you actually have higher pressure signals, which means you have better SNR. So compared to the open sphere, you actually get some SNR for free, some SNR improvement. Could I just ask a question sure. about the size of the sphere? Um, because my understanding is in a standard ambisonic microphone, like a soundproof microphone, you essentially want the microphones all to be at exactly the same location, which is physically impossible. But that would make the sphere infinitely small so that you've got phase coherence you know, in all capsules. Yeah, perfect. So, yeah. And, and yet, it seems to me you're saying the larger the sphere, to some extent, the better. Is that because you're not also looking at the velocity? No, you, you, no. You, we do exactly the same thing. It's if you, if these, all these sensors, they get combined in a smart way to form these patterns. Yeah. And the phase center of this combined 
um, beam former is the center of the sphere. So all these things are face centered in the center of the sphere. So it's the same idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. Mm -hmm. how, how are the capsules affected by the heat generated by the conversion? They're okay. We were actually concerned about it. It's true. They, the, the sphere, the eigenmike, it gets, gets warm. Things like 40 degrees or so we measured for degree C. We have a um, nice picture um, from an outside recording where we're standing around the eigenmike. Is it showing? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, what's the perceptual differences between like the spherical design and the uh, like tetra design, like the what the four capsule? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the like perceptual differences that people observe? Um, what would be the difference in the in your in your? Well, for one thing. All the, all the open designs right now are first order, while all the higher order have, have the rigid sphere. Um, so I guess you would have to compare a first order with a rigid sphere with a first order of, of the open sphere. And we have not done the direct AB, but it will really depend on, on the quality of, of, your, of your capsules and of your system more than anything else. Do you have experience comparing the two? No, no, um, not yet. But okay. what you can do is, so when you run simulations and you simulate the effects, what would happen? Because what you normally do often listen to experiments, you, because you want to get rid of, of random things because you, you test the quality, so perception, so you simulate. You can simulate how the eigen mic would react on a sound field. So you simulate a sound source coming from a certain direction. And then with this artificial signals, you can use uh, an open sphere or a rigid sphere. So there we did some listening experiments, not yet on a scientific level, which show some perceptual impact. Um, but I think it's minor. Mm. It's, more, it's li way more linked to other, other design parameters of your microphone. Yeah, the nice thing with the Eigen mic is also because it's the rigid sphere, it's really very close to your physical model. So the, the compensation you put in, it's, we didn't measure anything there. It's really, we just took the, the physical model and, and that just came out perfectly. While if you have these, these tetrahedron arrangements, the capsules are, are so big that at, once you go like four or five kilohertz, the, the capsules will have a major impact on, on your sound field. So you will have to think about what to do what to do there. So you have to do some experimental EQ that then has to be direction. You have to decide which direction you put in this EQ. So it becomes much more complicated. Which also complicates the listening because do you just listen for, for, one, for one direction? Do you listen for, for an ambisonic playback? It, yeah, there are many components. So yeah, briefly, other um, applications for the circular array. So it's clear we use it for ambisonic playback. But we can also just use it as a generic microphone with a changeable beam pattern. Like you know these expensive Sennheisers or Neumanns where you can choose, where you can go from Omni to Cardi to Dipole by, by turning a knob. So this is basically first order, you have, a, you have an omni term and you have a dipole, and then you just mix the omni and the dipole and you get from omni to subcardiate to cardiate to hypercardiate to, to dipole pattern. And so the same can be done with, the, with any ambisonic microphone. And with the higher order ambisonic microphone, you just have many more degrees of freedom. So you can really, yeah, combine them in, in, in many different ways. Plus, the other great advantage here is with a sphere, you can combine them to define your pattern, but then you can also steer your pattern into in 3D space. So what I was saying earlier, we record the sound field, and once we have the sound field, we can then later on go into the sound field and explore the sound field by moving 
a beam, like a shotgun beam in the sound field and see what sounds coming from this direction, what sounds coming from this direction. And so we have, if we have two or three instruments that are in different directions, we can then actually extract those three different instruments and then put them at different locations or, yeah, we have lots, many degrees of freedom in, in post-processing there. With human voice as well, have two yeah. different persons and you can yeah. you know, shotgun both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or you can do a stereo setup or 5.1 um, with it by just forming, yeah, forming the, the cardioids in, in the different directions and stuff. Yeah, so when you do the mobile beam forming, do you still get the rear lobe when you do go to super cardioid or? Yeah, we, I, I show those patterns. But, but it gets better. With the higher order, it gets better. So this is basically how it works. We have our, this is just showing a symmetric pattern. So we just show the, the zero degree beams, zero order, first order, second order, third order. And so we give each one of them a certain weighting. And then, yeah, some, some of those weighted patterns up. And we end up with, in this case, it just shows a third order supercardioid. So we have a preferred direction up here, and then not much sound, sound pickup from, from all the other angles. So briefly here, this again shows, I think this is really the nice plot that will summarize all the non-ideal behavior we touched on so far. The example is a third order cardioid. Cardioid is defined that there's zero sensitivity from 180, and maximum sensitivity from the front. So that's what we see in this waterfall plot here. It's angle on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. So we get maximum sensitivity at zero, and then pretty quickly we drop off, and there is then minus 30 is, is dark blue, and we already see that at about 120, we're already below minus 30 dB in sensitivity. So and ideally, this is what you would get from 30 hertz to 20 kilohertz. But then our non-ideal behavior kicks in. So what we see going to lower frequencies, these modes drop off. We saw that the second order mode, we only get, well, the, this is a third order, yeah. So the, the second order mode, we only get from like 400 hertz on. So we see here at 400 hertz, our second order mode drops off. And we see here our second order mode drops off. So our pattern changes, our behavior changes. And then the other thing is the high end where we get the spatial aliasing. So we see that lots of these modes now come in that we can't control anymore. So our spatial um, behavior up there is pretty much undefined. And that's uh, aliasing frequency of eight kilohertz. This is simulated, uh, measured. We get maybe a little bit beyond eight kilohertz, maybe nine kilohertz, a little bit better. But those are our two, two um, issues. So you have one at the above eight k. Does that appear perceptually omnidirectional? Or up, up towards? Yeah, I think nobody really. That's the interesting thing. Nobody. Yeah, I guess we all have listened to, to ambisonic, maybe not to ambisonic recordings, because that's different from like the ambisonic pieces that are played. They really have monos, most of them mono sources that get steered in, in, in space. So they, they really work, work with this, work with the ideal. They, these problems don't exist. That's why I like to distinguish between encoder and an eigenbeam former, or ambisonic signals and eigenbeam signals, because the the recorded ambisonic signals are different than the synthesized ambisonic signals because of those two behaviors. Yeah. And um, it's, it's above eight kilohertz. So it's really, for most practical purposes, it's okay. It's, I was never really bothered by it. But yeah, to tell a little side story, I had a discussion with someone from, from Film Sound, and he was setting up this this elaborate test where he tested 10 different um, microphone arrangements to record 
ambient sound. He just set it up on, on the sidewalk. There was gravel, there was leaves blowing, there were birds. And so he would record these 10 different setups and then have a little panel of people and asking them to, to rate the, the quality of the amb ambient sound that he would get. And there was, an amb there was an ambisonic mic in this setup as well. And the ambisonic mic came out last. And I talked to him, and one reason he was saying was that the, the image, there was a bird in there, and the image of the bird really was very unstable. And that was one thing that bothered people. And the ambisonic microphone he was using has a has an aliasing cut of, of five kilohertz. Yeah, so without really knowing and listening to, to the recording, it's likely that the bird just was in this aliasing region. And so it's, it's undefined. It's just spatially somewhere. Yeah, so this is why I think it's good to know all these non-ideal behaviors so you don't get frustrated when you deal with it, but you know where it's coming from and maybe can address it. So actually, when you cut off, or cut off, when you get the problems of aliasing above close to five kilohertz, that's all the elevation cues that happen at, a five, at above five kilohertz. So I wouldn't mind too much above eight kilohertz, because then at least you get a stable localization in elevation. Um, but around five kilohertz-ish, it's not so nice when you have a lot of aliasing. So, and when you compare um, recordings for example, with the Eigen mic and the first order microphone array, um, ambience recordings and whatever, there's a huge difference in, in not only the perception of elevation, but in clarity, in, again, depth perception and whatever. And then, fortunately or unfortunately, as however you want to see it, um, it very much depends how you encode the Eigen mic and then how you decode over your sphere, which sounds annoying because you sit in studio, it doesn't sound as you expect it to, and then you try different encoders and decoders. I see the other way around. It gives you a lot of possibilities by having a recording to refine the recording and to get a better result by using different encoders and decoders which match actually your setup or, or what you want to do with your recording. And we recently had this with David Monaki, so we, we, we yeah. will play a, an example. So MH supported David Monaki who is doing rainforest recordings. And they are amazing. It's just, it's an orchestration far beyond imagination. And he was recording with the Eigen mic for a long time now. I think he you gave him. Well, he used this particular trip, what, 2000, late 2016, I think. 16. Yeah, that was the particular trip. But he has tons, terabytes of recordings. And you know, you just go, you're not just going to the rainforest and record like you go to the city of Troy with a little backpack. So. And then he was listening to the, to the recordings and he got a little bit, oh no, it's not what I expected. And we've been working the last three months with him together on defining for his problems, or for his recordings, a nice encoding decoding situation. And we could fix a lot of the perceptual problems. So this gives you a lot of freedom, which is nice. The other thing is you have to gain for yourself the experience to use all this encoding decoding to get the best result out of your microphone array. One thing I should add here, this is ideal, this is non-ideal. And this non-ideal, I mean, this 8 kilohertz and this 400 hertz, they are, well, the 8 kilohertz, this is specific to the Eigen mic. The 400, that's specific to this particular encoder that was used here. So this frequency can be shifted in, in both ways, depending on your trade-off of the cutoff and the noise you allow. But both of the, well, but this aliasing here, that's not specific to the Eigen mic. This is, all four first order microphones have, have the same issue. And most of them actually have it below eight kilohertz. And plus, it's not just the aliasing, but also because of these large sensors. It's also that a dipole is not a perfect dipole anymore. At, yeah, once, once your frequency, your wavelength comes into the range of the size of your, of your capsule. So the way the low end can be fixed is we can do a frequency dependent decoder and just scale back the order. So we have third order and then we just scale back to first order and then to first order. So we see this is our third order weighting. 
second hour waiting and first hour waiting. In this way, we get at least a cardiac behavior over the whole frequency range. We trade off some um, spatial resolution, but um, in exchange for, for our perfect cardiac, for our zero, zero in the back. There's a little bit of a non-ideal behavior here, which is in the, in the transition band where we really transition from one pattern to another. And so we get a flat response at least up to eight, nine kilohertz. And then here, this is the frequency region, which looks much worse in the simulation than it does in the, in the measurement. And to fix the upper end for the modal beamformer is um, we're lucky with the sphere because the sphere, sphere gives us the diffraction and the pressure buildup in the front. So a pressure sensor in a rigid sphere has a natural directivity pattern, which actually comes close to a cardioid. So this is just a pressure sensor in, in the front of a sphere. Um, so you do get the attenuation due to the diffractive body. If you want to get it a little bit narrow, we combine three pressure sensors closest to the, to the steering direction, and we, we get, get narrower, but we also now start to see some not so nice behavior. We see grading lobes because of the spacing and stuff. And so in our final model beamformer then, we do have the frequency dependent model beamformer to keep our pattern as the desired pattern. And at the high end, we just stitch on a, a triplet or a single capsule. So we get at least a controlled spatial behavior at the upper end. And this now is a measurement of a hypercardiate. Coming back to, to your question now, Seth. Um, so 500 hertz, this is transition region from first order to, to second order. So we're somewhere between first and second. <laughs> Unfortunately, first order of one kilohertz is the transition region be between second order and third order. But two and four kilohertz, we have a perfect second order, a perfect third order hypercardiot. Uh, they're really, that, that textbook, they're perfect. And then eight kilohertz, we see aliasing starting to show, meaning we can't control the pattern as well as we would like to. But still, it's, it's not too bad. And then 16 kilohertz, we transition to, to the triplet, so we still maintain our, our look direction and then attenuation from the back. OK, that was theory done. <laughs> Now we can, yeah, now I start with some, some pictures. That, yeah, we'll see. There might be some interesting picture there. So this is kind of way, way before even thinking about the eigenmark. Gary at Bell Labs at the time did some intensity probes where he was trying to measure the omnicomponent and the, and the dipole components. So he built these little spheres with six sensors in them. And then much later on in 2001, uh, 2002, this was now with MH, the first prototype, 24 element um, acrylic ball with some pressure capsules integrated, 24 wires, actually 48 wires coming out. This was in the first version that was actually sold sold a few of those. This was 32 elements, but still wires coming out with a lot big rack of, of ADD converters. And then the first version of the eigen mic was 2007. Looks like this. And then a year later, this is the final version we're still, in, still selling today. We have a windscreen for it. Yeah, and this is the concept of the next version, which we hope to release later this year. We're saying this for five years now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were too ambitious. We, 
There was another version in EM360 with MEMS microphones was the idea. And we spent a lot of time and effort on that one, but it was just too ambitious. The, the MEMS sensors weren't there where we weren't at a point where we would like them to be in terms of maximum sound pressure level and self noise. And so we eventually came to the conclusion we have to scale back and do this at least as an intermediate step. The EM64 is still electrode capsules, still high end electrode capsules, 10 millimeter, they're a little bit smaller. We keep the size about the same, but double the amount of sensors, which means we bring up the aliasing frequency to 12, 13 kilohertz. So at that point, aliasing frequency for most applications shouldn't be an issue anymore. And then also the low end gets a little bit better because we just have more capsules, so we are more tolerable to noise. Is there any reducement in the self noise for the each capsule? The self noise. The self noise. Yeah, it, exactly. Because the the current one uses 40 millimeter capsules, to be 10 millimeter capsules. The current one is 15 dB SPL self noise. This one, I believe, is about 20 dB self noise. Don't quote me on that, but it's in that range. But um, we improved the electronics behind it, and we have twice as many capsules. So the noise, the output noise, by maintaining everything else the same, is pretty much the same. Yeah. So more or less same noise performance we're expecting. This is an application we provide for free with it. Um, it's very basic. It just gives you, you can have up to 32 tracks, um, you can choose the steering direction and you can choose the, the beam pattern. And we give some, provide some default beam patterns. Um, and you can convert, you can have microphones coming in or, and you can save it as eigenbeams or ambisonic signals. So it does the A to B conversion. The nice thing, it's so simple that it's easy to use. You just start it and you're ready to go with the eigenmic. Yeah, while we saw Rama and, and Marcus with all these patches, it, it quickly becomes very complicated. And for people who are not familiar with it, it's really, it's a big hurdle you have to, to jump through to, to get going. So I think this is so people immediately can do something with it and then on parallel just learn Max or learn Reaper and, and then go from there. Sorry? You get 32 discrete monowaves. It's your final file. Yeah, you can choose. Yeah, you can choose. You can use this for recording. So yeah, if you do it for recording, you get you record your 32 individual microphone okay. capsules. Yeah, and then you can convert those 32 microphone capsules into your eigenbeam or ambisonic signals, which would be you can limit the order depending on how much storage you have. Um, between one and, and fourth order. Yeah, we provide full technical specifications for, for the eigenmic in terms of directivity patterns, cutoff frequencies and stuff. And I've not seen it from, from for any other um, ambisonic microphone. So these are the cutoffs with the current encoder, 400, 1000 and 1 1.8. We're working on the next version, which will actually give you a few sets of cutoffs so you can choose yourself the trade-off between the noise, like this one allows 40 dB of gain, so you do have quite a bit of noise in there. If you want to have it quieter, you just, you can shift up those um, cutoff frequencies. You saw earlier panoramics, the encoder that's in there, you already have it. You can already choose your, your cutoff, so you can choose trade-off spatial resolution versus um, bandwidth. Uh, Zero order, Omni. Uh, this one we show two, three, four, five, yeah, to eight kilohertz. So this would be the noise that gets introduced by going through the encoder. And yeah, we had the question earlier. So the Omni term actually, at the low frequencies, you actually gain a noise because you you sum up these 32 capsules, um, you gain 15, 16 dB of noise. With a self-noise of, of 15 dB, 
you're almost at the at the threshold of, of hearing here in terms of self noise of the of the omni component of the eigenmic. Then at higher frequencies, we saw those those spherical Bessel functions. They they lose sensitivity, so we have to compensate. So that's why the noise actually, well, where the where the level goes down and the noise, um, therefore, would go up. The first order component, yeah, we see at, at like 30 hertz, 40 hertz, we introduce 18 dB of noise into the system going through the beam formula. But since we hardly ever listen to just the dipole component, it will, in any playback system, the dipole component most likely will be combined with the Omni component. So the combined output will never be that bad. Yeah, some, some, here we see the, the second order component. It's actually, yeah, the 400 hertz cutoff frequencies, third order, 1,000. This is coming back to an earlier question with the hypercardioid. So this shows basically the cardioid patterns. The green is the, well, the blue is the first order cardioid. So this is the one with a regular, that any regular cardioid microphone you would expect. But this one is really you, with the eigen mic, you do get this from 40 hertz to 8 kilohertz, pretty much perfectly. And then the higher you go in order, the narrower the cardioid gets. This is the supercardioid. Supercardioid is defined as maximizing the energy from front over the energy from the, from the rear. So this, I think, is the most popular on-stage microphone to attenuate the audience and, and uh, emphasize the, the vocalist. So you get this minus 10 dB, or minus 12, I think it is, for the first order. But if you go higher in order, the third order already, you hardly get any real lobe. So it's almost as good as the cardio in terms of attenuation from the rear, but you do get even more side attenuation here. And then the hypercardioid, which is the best pattern to use in a isotropic noise field. This is the minus 6 dB side lobe attenuation for your first order. But then if you go higher in order, this one comes down and it's the most narrowest pattern you can get. And then your regular dipole. Yeah, I think we've seen enough specifications, did we? So. They're all on our website. If you want to go into detail, um, you can check them out there. But this basically, yeah, this, I, yeah, briefly this one I said earlier, the cardioid. So you really do get an almost perfect cardioid from, this one only shows to 100 hertz, to about 8 kilohertz. So here we are. So any more questions to the how much? <laughs> how much? Price. Oh, price. Um, it's, it's recorded. Um. <laughs> oh. Okay, don't worry. You can tell me later. Yeah, it's ex it's, but can it's you expensive. Buy it from companies? Is it uh, no? Yes, device? I think there is start to no, maybe not companies yet. Yeah. But I think if more and more people ask companies that they provide them, yeah. they will get them. So that that's what's happening. Yeah. Actually, in Europe, you have quite many now. Okay. Yeah, we have, I don't know, 200 plus out there now. So okay. there, are, there are like many of, of them out there in the field Maybe now. Some of them so if you get in touch, I mean, you're from Brazil. Kind of. So I'm not sure if there is a, I, I don't know if there is one in Brazil. But often people are willing to, to loan them to one another. And, yeah. So what's causing the heating? Is it just processing that's going on in the eigen mic? Yeah. Or is it yeah. There's the problem is the the there's an um, Ethernet connector, but it's not running a standard Ethernet protocol. It's Avium, which at the time when we built it, it looked like a promising standard. It's a company in Pennsylvania. They do multi-channel audio over IP. A little bit what's now basically Dante and the others took over, but they were promising at the time. So we went with those guys and. Um, 
Yeah, so there is an AVM chip in the sphere, an AVM chip in the, in the external box, and that chip is really what's burning the, the power. And also the, the ADCs heat quite up. I don't yeah. know for but the chips you're using. The, the we're using the Wolf, using, the Wolf yeah, from yeah. chips are used. That's why we, they're low power, so. Yeah. The heat actually might be okay for the capsules, you know. It yeah. Actually, yeah. There's, there's a side it's effect good. which is beautiful for field recordings, because normally when you do field recordings, you buy these heating things that you protect your capsules uh, when it's humid outside. And so you get it for free. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not, I'm, like um, David, when he was in, in the rainforest, I mean, it's a super wet, it's like a sauna. It's, it's hot, it, it's humid, and he was very concerned. But we tested it before he went, put it in, <laughs> in a sauna environment, and it survives. It's, it's, it's good. Um, I'm not quite understanding the, the filters that you were showing us associated with the orders. Um, because obviously it doesn't mean if you go up in, in order you lose all the lower frequencies. So it's you lose the frequency. Sum together so that you get increased. You, you do lose the low frequencies for some orders. So your zero and first order, they will provide you the full bandwidth. But your, your second order component drops out at like 400 hertz. So if you play back at, at 300 hertz, you will only get a first order signal. If you play back at 500 hertz, you will get a second order signal. If you play back at one point something kilohertz, you get a third order signal. And if you play back at two kilohertz and, be, and beyond, between two and eight kilohertz, you get a full fourth order signal. So that means that those frequency components in the recording um, get reproduced at at different orders? I'm not quite understanding how that works. So let's say we record the signal on the microphone and we're recording, what, um, fourth or third order, um, and then we play back third order in the hall. Um, does that mean that the frequency response of both recording and playback is not is going to lose Whatever that is, everything below 1K or something. You, in the, yeah, here, if you would play back the signal here, which we will do now, is um, at the low frequency, you will have, we, you will not have the second order and third order components. So your, your, your beams, essentially, this, what's essentially happening in the, play, in the ambisonic playback system is that you point, is essentially, you, you point virtual microphones towards each speaker location, Gives this, each one has a very specific directivity pattern, so they kind of all match up in the center to form a nice recreative space. But um, at the low frequencies, you, you will not have the higher order components, so your spatial resolution is, is less. Which, in practice, is probably not a big problem because your ear at, at low frequency isn't as sensitive to localization anyhow. But in essence, then, at fifth order, you're still hearing all of the orders up to fifth order. So you, it's just that you are getting increased directional specificity as you go up in orders. Exactly, basically. exactly. And so it's only those frequencies that are affected by the filter in that order that have that directional ability because of the spherical harmonics at that, yeah. at that level. Yeah. OK, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I put together... Um, I mean, there's, I know some people here have experience with the Eigen mic. Um, probably most of you not. So put together a set of recordings that we did. Keep in mind, we are not sound engineers. We are just engineers. And so we just went about it initially very naive by just, initially we just wanted to provide the microphone to people to use. So we just, handed out the microphone with a flat frequency response and we figured, okay, from here on, sound engineers know what to do with it. They put their EQ on and stuff, but it's more complicated than that, we learned. And so we went out, did our own recordings and just trying to learn things about it. And uh, so there's a varying set of, of recordings that cover many aspects, I think. So I think you, I hope you'll enjoy it. So to give you an idea, the first two recordings and then one later on is done in a, in a barn, in a 
big space up in Vermont. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I'm impressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we, we, we were able to get in there for, for a day. Yeah, it's where I guess Fish recorded their first few albums or so. Um, so it's a big space, very reverberant. There's um, up here, there's a little walkway, and then there's a ladder here, which goes up into a cupola on top of the barn. The cupola is maybe, I don't know, six feet by six feet by six feet or so. And so the first recording is um, a musician with a guitar in this cupola, in this tiny reverberant space, um, playing Little Martha. I have a question. Have you tried to use different way, like using hanging, like a, like a mic, and a, instead of using this? Did we try to hang? We did. Yeah, we also did recordings hanging it. Yes, there will be actually one recording later on. Um, yeah, maybe I should use now that the figure is up here. So this, the first one will be up here in the cupola. The other one will be a little bit what you see here. There will be the drummer here. There will be a synthesizer keyboard here. An upright bass here, and then the eigen mic in, in the center. And then later on, there will be a recording with two eigen mics, and one is really kind of hanging in the drum kit. So, really, Jeremy had to be careful playing the drums, not hitting the eigen mic. So, the idea was really, it was just, was the last recording we did, and what, what else can we do? We had all configurations done, and so we just figured, okay, let's just see what happens if you put the eigen mic right in there. And so, you basically, yeah, have your, you, you will have your head inside the drum kit, kind of. And, um, yeah, and then the other recordings are from, from other spaces. So, we start with Little Martha. I discussed with Marcus in advance, and he pointed it out already, that for the playback, you have to find a way to, to, to map your ambisonic signals to the speakers. And there are, I don't know, 10 different ways you can do this. And so, Panoramics, I think, has six different ones built in or so. Um, yes. And so, it's... we didn't have time beforehand to listen carefully and figure out what's best. And we thought maybe it's also interesting to you to maybe compare different decoders. So we might, for some of the pieces, just listen to two or three different decoders, see if we hear a difference in, in playback experience. So currently we are using energy preserving. I didn't check for um, the condition number of the setup here, so I don't want to go to mode matching. No, don't uh, do, yeah. No. Um, <laughs> Um, but maybe, I don't know, do, what else is there? The Alrad and the direct sampling. So I think here the energy preserving will work. Okay. Um, I don't want to play the Alrad because I found yeah. an error and I'm not sure if it's a nice representation of the Alrad is a hybrid decoder in between vector-based amplitude panning and, and ambisonics. And it looks very good on paper. And it should sound good, but our implementation doesn't sound good, which doesn't mean the decoder is not good. So that's why I don't want to use our implementation of Alrad, which mm -hmm. would maybe give you a wrong impression of the decoder. Um, mm -hmm. As long as I haven't verified with the guys from Graz that it's really the mathematics behind or whatever, why it doesn't sound as I would expect it. Mm -hmm. but I think the Alrad in general is, with a semi-dome, the Alrad, you have to be careful how you treat your your lower, your lower circle, kind of. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I agree, let's, let's... So we stick so far with energy preserving, because I know it works in this room, but we can use different normalizations, um, which has less impact than yeah. what's in here, or we cannot see very good. So it's a basic encoder, or um, we could use in-phase, so that we, we try that we get rid of the inverse phase of neighboring loudspeakers. Then there's the max RE, which is the maximum energy vector towards a direction. And then hybrids that you say, for example, in phase max RE would be in phase for low frequencies and max RE for higher frequencies with a crossover. So we might maybe then listen to an example two or three times and just swap into between different options, which give you just a very brief thing that 
perceptually quite a lot of things are happening. So there was this straight st recorded and then played back. There was no editing happening in between. Actually, maybe a little bit EQ in the, in the mid-frequency range, maybe a little bit. Does it say EQ in the file? No. No, that was really straight, straight through. Where was the microphone was positioned in this one? Well, the microphone was maybe, maybe three to four feet in front of the, the person playing the guitar. Oh. Uh, and then this, the, the two of them are really, he was kind of leaning against the wall in, in this cupola, so it was really tied up in there. Um, yeah, it was a space this, by this. And he's like over this. there? Yeah. I think he was like kind of here, yeah. Mm. Yeah, or, 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 yeah. Everything was pretty reflective. That's why it's not so easy, yeah. but I think he was there. It feels like the image yeah. is always behind me. Uh, yeah, 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 it's, it's, yeah. But is that a raw, um, raw file? No. no, it says EQ there. It says so, EQ there. So yeah. EQ, which means there was just a little bit of a, because the eigen mic is EQ to be, and currently we don't only have this option that's also on our to-do list is to give you a few different buttons to, oh, to play with. But so this one has just, I think, just a 2 dB rise or so in the 5 kilohertz region. So that, that's all that was done to it. So this is, let me briefly explain. So this is the, yeah, I think this is the three musicians around the, so there will be a drum kit, there will be a keyboard, and there will be an upright bass. And we are comparing the, uh, we, are, we are going to compare the decoder, decoders, right? We can try to switch between decoders yes. during playback, yeah. Can we just try it, if everyone is okay with that? Can we try to listen to the different uh, decoder before we forget? Okay. We can maybe just listen to the next example. Yeah. During the next example, if you agree, we can then just swap uh, in between different decoders. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
now we could listen again and then swap in between different uh, decoders. So this would be N3D, so another normalization. I think there's a good sense. No, this. So you see, as long as you're using the same normalizations for your encoding, decoding, it's fine. So I go to in-phase. Over the entire frequency range, which is not really beautiful. So it's not considered that you do it, but just to see how, how strong the effect of a decoder can be. Yeah, because you do in phase overall. Um, so max RE should be better. Like in phase. So max RE. Max RE is this Makita theory of localization, which computes the maximum energy uh, vector, and it tries to get the uh, maximum energy vector uh, into the direction of the source. So, up, start it again. And what it normally uses is a hybrid. So for base frequencies, you use in phase, and for higher frequency, max RE. Um, so it's a crossover, I don't know, let's say 250. And I go back and forth in between the basic. And the in-phase max RE. Again the basic. Oops, sorry. Max sorry. Okay, so the next recording was actually contributed by Mung um, University of Rochester. Yeah, Ming Lung. Ming Lung, sorry. Yeah. Ming Lung. Um, uh, this setup. This is a large-scale choral orchestral piece uh, called Mendelssohn's Elijah. So the, the entire length, uh, it has two parts. The entire duration is about two hours and then 30 minutes. So I will play only uh, from the, uh, almost the end of the first part. And then I want to hear that because there, is a, there are two soloists and also there is an orchestra and a choir. So I want you to help me to localize the sources. <laughs> so um, which order? Uh, fourth order. Fourth order. Will you orient us where the orchestra? Yeah, it's okay. I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, just listen. <laughs> I, I also don't know where is the front. I, I think this is. I think it's set up that this is the front. Yeah, so we uh, can normally it's set up that this is the front, but we can rotate. You know. Front. Yeah. No, I think so Thank you for helping me do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it SN3D or N3D? Oh, SN3D. SN3D. Okay. Yeah, it's <clears throat> something, something is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, because even but from the previous recording, I hear like the the vocal is from the from the so, so it should be ACR. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, so. Ah, yes, I can say you what's wrong. Sorry. This was my fault. Um, this was the last minute fix here. No, 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 it was just my fault. Okay. So it's funny that nobody's, nobody's complaining other than those who have recorded. Yeah, but I, yeah because I yeah, yeah. Open, open you, you, you should, you should, You should all cry. Um, <laughs> because actually what happened, what happened is, <laughs> this is what. It's yeah. very funny. Nobody. It's, but it's such a complex system. It's so easy to. 
No, but I didn't. I didn't know that we. So I was preparing everything very quick in between my uh, so Rama's talk or our presentation here after the lunch break um, to get an eigen mic recording in there, and I didn't know that you already have HUA enco encoded things. So it took me two minutes to set it up, but um, I have forgotten to mute the eigen mic because I use the same input channels to drag and drop the file and to unmute the ambisonic. So what you have heard was funny because. It could be done on artistic purpose. Oh. <laughs> I have re-encoded into the eigen mic an already decoded signal, so um, this shouldn't work at all. So you ink oh, that's... <laughs> So just give me a second to get this set. Sounds different? Yeah, yeah that's better defined. I can, wherever you want to. Is the no different from space? It should be. Sounds yeah. like it. Yeah. No, she's here. Yeah, that's correct. If that's the front, then. Yeah. yeah. The okay. front soprano, the front is from there. Ah, okay. So, like, <laughs> it always depends how you define your accents. What is your zero? You know, you can wherever you want to have it. Okay. 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 Let's start. Let's let me know what you want to do. Okay. Yeah. I think it it's better. Yeah. Yeah, I might was in the, the sixth row, he said. Sixth, seventh row. Okay. I'll check it. Seventh row. This was also straight, straight recording, no editing. No, no, no editing. Yeah, yeah editing. The only editing is like the cut out. Yeah. <laughs> um, what? Hmm? what uh, uh, that's a concert hall uh, with about 
can, can I look uh, like a shoe can accommodate? Not, a shoe, not, not shoe boxes a little bit like that. Okay. Yeah, but also not like a sector. So well, that's uh, at the Eastman uh, Kodak Hall. Oh, okay. And yeah, then yeah. that's about, can accommodate about 2,200 people. Mm -hmm. So that's a big hall. Mm -hmm. Was orchestra in the pit? Uh, not, it's on the stage. On the stage. Okay. Yeah, and the chorus is behind the, the orchestra. Oh, they were elevated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a picture because I also have video mm -hmm. and I also have a final recording. Okay. So. But once again, when you receive the file and you look at the name, um, it says what it is. But when you want to, without any side information, decode this into ambisonics, mm -hmm. you have no clue how. You don't know if it's ACN, uh, which order, which order you can easily. 25 channels, it's clear. Um, so when you, when you do recordings or you provide files, to always provide at least if it's ACN and SN3D. Yeah. Because otherwise, on the other end, you know, you hear something and you never know, was it not well recorded? Was it not well done? Is it you? Uh, mm -hmm. And you don't, especially channel ordering, that's the worst. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You quickly can figure out SN3D, N3D is not nice if you do the wrong one, but you might get around with it. But the channel order is something you will never ever figure out in your life. Um, <laughs> but SN3D, N3D, the problem there is yeah. that you probably even don't notice that you screwed up. Yeah. Because it's just so subtle, the, the differences in your playback. So you, you the one who mastered and recorded might have this very nice depth perception and you mess up with SN3D, N3D and it gets very flat mm -hmm. or vice versa. So. Um, the there should be, there be should be a new, we were talking about standards, there should be... I gave up. Have <laughs> you tried, <laughs> we tried yeah, it? Yeah, because that's really, there is a standard Ambix out there, which is unfortunately based on, yeah. on a CAF, on a, what is mm. it, computer, no, what's a, it, it's an Apple-based system, which I don't think anybody really mm. uses. Mm. So it would be nice if there would be a chunk that goes into a WAV file that has the ambisonic information. Yeah, so when, when we it's not out there. try to standardize ambisonic, we, we've been started the standardization in 2009, but we failed and then once I stepped out, so, but we should maybe agree at something in a monthly channel broadcast WAV file, you can put XML header information. So if the information is there, then everything should be there. So just write an XML header and in the XML header, just give tags and then it should be at least in there. Can you embed the XML on the MPEG H? Huh? Can you embed the XML file on MPEG H? I don't know. Ask Fraunhofer. Yeah, I think MPEG H. Yeah, you, you, all, you, they have it it's, embedded. It's, it's, that, that, that's yeah. That's they have right. ADM it's really information in there, it. so yeah. it's standardized and it even understands ADM. Yeah. Yeah. But um, and MBSonics is also in ADM, so this might be a chance to standardize it. Do you have any of David's uh, jungle? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Do you have the next two are a little bit different in a way that they are actually. Edited, so the four. This would be yeah. Four A mm -hmm. would be um. It's these are four musicians in a square with the eigen mic in the center in a studio. And so the first one would be just the eigen mic in the center of the four. So you would have four distinct musicians. Then the next one, the musicians were also had each one had spot mics. So there would be just the specialized spot mics. And then number or C would be combining the, the spots to give you the, the direct clarity with the EM32 to bring in some, some room. Are those beamform spots from the eigenmic? No. no so so we tried this too. That works as well. But if you have access to, to true spot mics, yeah. you can't be distance. Yes, yeah, so maybe just do the first minute or so. Well, I can see it in the 
Okay. So the second one. Mark, is there any way to bring the sound down so it doesn't seem so overhead? Uh, that's a problem, Chenru's ambisonics when you use a hemisphere. Um, so what I very often do, I decode it also to 2D, 2D ambisonics, um, and then, or I make the this can you lower. Do it with floor monitors. Hmm? Can you do it with floor monitors? Yeah, you can do it with floor monitors as well. We have some here, um, but it's not enough. Um, but it's in general, perceptually, ambisonics always has this tendency to to be perceived a little bit higher. Yeah, uh, like in our studio, because we have micro, uh, we have speakers from the uh, from the floor, so it looks like yeah, we can position the sources. Yeah, we also have speakers from the floor, but the problem in in, in public representation with speakers on the floor is that when you all stand up, <laughs> then you stop blocking the sound from the speakers. <laughs> That's yeah. a, a general problem. In the studio, it works quite nice when you're alone in the studio and you have a, a nearby full sphere, then it works quite well. But um, I've been wondering how, how big an effect is, are, are all of our bodies having, just occluding and absorbing the sound? In general, or? Just for the playback. Like in a normal situation with a sound source? So if a musician plays in a room, you have the same effect than with the traveling wave in a room. I think you're probably helping here, actually, yeah. except for blocking the, <laughs> the speakers on the floor. So the second example with the spot mics. I believe that was a 50-50 mix. Uh -huh. Yeah. The first, one, the first one is so much more. I, I say so much more interesting. It's so much. That sounded like a recording of those people playing music. Yeah. The other one was kind of like the first one. 
seem to kind of create like ethereal, like not more imaginative. Because I think, I don't know why exactly, but it seems maybe like, just like glossy paint. And the other ones are like, what, flat, like matte. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's more realistic, I guess. Th that is the certainly first, true. The first one is, I, probably because it's more, it's more floating around up here. More I think it's the other way around. We are more used to this kind of recordings mm -hmm. that you use spot microphones and you, mm -hmm. you get everything yeah, stable yeah. in room. It's yeah. way, so we are, it's far away from natural listening. Mm -hmm. If you sit in the barn, you wouldn't hear it like in the recording mm -hmm. because we, we yeah. bring the things closer. Yeah. Um, we try to, to add some timber for high frequencies. So it, it's, it's the kind we, yeah. we are used to listen to recorded music. Yeah, memories of it. Uh, I'm like, oh, I thought, okay, I know what that is. I've and heard that we, ha we, we had this when we've been comparing 3D recordings with spot mics and without spot mics and really well done recordings and they sound very natural, yeah. but very me people think they sound unnatural because their natural sticks more to what you know from recordings yeah. because I'm listening to a recording. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very funny. Yeah, it's like it's brand new. It's like a new, it's like a new sound. The, amb the, the eigen mic or the old. The oldest. The oldest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the oldest. The oldest. The oldest. Like being in yeah. the ensemble rather than listening to it. On it's stage. it's yeah. especially yeah. interesting with headphones. Mm -hmm. Because with headphones, when you have a very nice binaural recording and you use your HDF, so you have a very good out of the head localization, and you make something which sounds less direct, which is not in your head like with a stereo recording, many people rate it's interesting, but it's less nice or less natural. Because when I wear headphones, I'm used to that the sound is in my head from left to right. Yeah. Um, less natural is good. Less natural is... It's, it's good. <laughs> 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 I think it's, it's weird. It's more, it's like, wow, this is, I know, I know these instruments. I know the timbre of the instruments, but the air is different, mm. you know. Mm. Like it's a new way of hearing something. I, I don't know, I have... I mean, I think definitely, like, in the first recording, I could hear lots of frequency loss in so many levels. Like, the, you know... The, the problem with the, with the recording of an ambisonic microphone is you kind of... you get what's there. So you have to make up your mind before how to position the, the musicians. Like, for example, the, the singer, the voice of the singer was rather low because he was at the same distance than the other instruments. Mm -hmm. yeah, With spot mics, you can fix this, you can bring them up. You, to some degree, you can fix it with ambisonic as well. You can go in there, editing, put a beam, bring it up and stuff. But then you start already editing and, and so on. So I think you have to spend more thought on your recording for beforehand. Um, and then, yeah, you, you get something that's whatever you get, you get. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the I mean, I, I did this when I was doing my master degree, like the, try to do the ambisonics with the conventional studio microphones, like two figure of eight, actually three figure of eight and one only. Of course you had a microphone body and you had that whole- And they're not coincidental and stuff. And stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, but I could say that I had a really good, you know, frequency response generally very, you know, well defined in some ways. But I, I think what but you the, mentioned yeah. for the first recording, on the um, eigen mic only recording, it's not the frequency response of the eigen mic. It's just you're not using spot microphones to make up for the freak, natural frequency it's loss in between the instrument yeah. and the microphone. Mm -hmm. uh, because we are used to listen to closed miking. You're used to have this, this very high extended to high frequency extended frequency response of a spot microphone. And if you listen, a fair comparison would be a 5.1 or whatever, a stereo microphone on a, on a far away, same distance than the Eigen mic. And then you compare it with the Eigen mic, and that tells you a whole different story. So when you do an orchestra recording, put a 5.1 tree or a stereo microphone at the same position than the Eigen mic, and com comparing those recordings, it's really interesting. Because then you have the same distance to the instruments, you have the same um, high frequency losses, which you normally make up with spot microphones, which you can do with the eigen mic as well, because that's what we hear, uh, what we've heard at the end. That's the mix of with spot microphones. I mean, yours was done again, right? The orchestral piece. Yeah. No, 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 no. Which one? 
the piece, your piece here was that Eigenmiker was a Eigenmiker. Oh, it was Eigenmiker. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I also have a, another recording with the I found the interesting thing. We have, I've been recording with the Eigen mic in the anechoic chamber a lot, and and when you hear someone's voice while you're setting up to record something, it's it's underwhelming because it just sounds like their voice in the room and it, whatever. We the weirder the thing I try to record with it, like we did three people with aluminum foil around the Eigen mic, and then one person below because it's a anechoic chamber with a, a grid, and the the image. But then we invert the the image when we play it back in a dome and you get crazy it, it sounds like synthesis it's it's ins, it's insane and it doesn't make sense but it's like super realistic and interesting mm -hmm. but every time I try to like use it to record something that I know what it's going to sound like it sounds like the same sort of under realistic that like uh, if you hear someone get punched at a bar it's utterly un underwhelming because <laughs> because <laughs> spider-man punches like so human punch is not exciting, but like the thing I don't understand, like I, I spend all the time making trying to make sense of it, but it has a spatial realism to it that you can't that it, when I've tried to do it with with a bunch of mics in the middle and try to make a, 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 a surround recording it's under There is a yeah. beautiful recording I made the Technicolor uh, at an airport with Spitfires. So they recorded with the Eigen mic and you have Spitfires just going yeah. over the Eigen mic. Oh, sure. wow. And believe me, I, you know this effect from film, the artificial Spitfires, which, you know, they come and go. When you hear the Spitfire coming to the Eigen mic, you duck and cover. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is really amazing because yeah. something, so well, all, all which comes with it, you cannot simulate it. It's not only a trajectory, it's more than a simple trajectory. Wow. So that's the other way around, that this realism gives you more, which you, artificially you cannot create this effect. But it's a, I have to ask them to give us the, yeah, the recording. I, because I didn't it's, know about it's, that recording. The recording is really amazing. But it's precisely non-stationary sources that yeah. gets really interesting with the item mic. Because when you hear those stationary sources, you're like, I know what that should be, and I know where I should be listening to it. But when it's a moving source, you really hear dimensionality in a way that's... I think it's, I think it's also, when we're talking about the, the things that we've been programmed to expect, that we were talking about movie action sounds, but when it comes to music, yes. we've been programmed to expect so much in terms of music production. Yeah, well, I, we, we can't really hear correctly. Yeah. I think you're, we're also expecting to hear music from the front. Yes. I think we're expecting to hear music from the stage. Right. And I have always located either moving sources or uh, natural sound design, like the Spitfire or the, you know even like Bugs and you know yeah. that sort of thing, so much better than a stationary bass or a drum set or something. Because I'm so used to hearing music on the stage. Right. How, 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 what kind mm -hmm. of sound pressure levels yeah, yeah. to the uh, I, I can like take? Um, 130 dB. Uh, 130, okay. You get, um, more than, more than us. yeah, I think that's the, that's the 3 dB um, distortion kicks in. Maybe not And, and yeah, sure. Um, I'm curious about the layout of the speakers. So, were we hearing the ones that are like, not the speaker array, but up on the wall there? Yes. Yeah. So, and then we we're hearing the ones that are on the floor? Yes, okay. as well, they're integrated. So are there more on the floor back there that are, that we're um, There might be somewhere. Here is one. <laughs> <laughs> Some, somewhere there might be one or two. So, like, how precise um, are you guys in, like, setting up the different speakers in this room? Normally, you get into the center of the room, you take a laser pointer, and you get it as good as possible. So, of course, you have not a very high precision, but I think it's not that important. Because what's happening, actually, if you do real sound for reproduction, as, actually, some people, there are some papers which claim that when you do a perfect equalized system, you get more troubles with the sound for reproduction than with a less good equalized system, because um, you get a nice sound free reproduction in a sweet spot. And then outside, um, mm -hmm. so at the border of the sweet spot, you get more artifacts because it's well aligned. And if it's not well aligned, they smear it out. However, um, some people then say you don't have to equalize at all. I do not believe in that. Uh, so what you can do, you put a microphone in the middle of the room, but that's then your position, your perspective, your positioning. Uh, 
know, preferred listening sweet spot. To my experience, since I'm traveling a lot with, with domes of speakers and whatever, we are, we are getting to, I don't know, one degree close to the position we should have. Then, it, of course, it depends in which rooms you are when you play in, play in big halls where you have 100 meters radius spheres. Um, then it's getting a little bit more tricky. But I think it's fairly enough for playing in the back. Is this a defined geometry here in terms of some regular polyhedron? No, we, we or just something? try to, to get somehow triangles for the speakers to get them, but it's not a defined geometry. Okay. Because actually, what we wanted to have is a, a realistic situation. It's always nice, so for example, in our studio, because studio should be as perfect as possible, I get a very beautiful, it's even a dome of speakers, it's not on the walls. So I have the same distance to the sweet spot of the speakers, hung from the ceiling, it's a beautiful sphere of speakers, all coaxial, so that low, mid, and high frequencies come from the same point. Beautiful. But it's not real world. <laughs> um, of course, if you mix, you should have the best. Because if you introduce errors to your mixing, they get worse in real world. So that, of, that for sure. But in setting up ambisonic systems, so actually you get a panning function, which is a sync function defined by a three dimensional sync function defined by the order of your ambisonics. So being a little bit left and right, of course, affects the sound field reproduction. But we are far from holophony. We would, as I was saying when I gave the introduction, we would need 900 speakers in here just to make a perfect sound field for the size of your head. Would be cool, but we don't have this. So this energy preserving decoding is pushing ambisonics a little bit towards panning. So we do a little bit better panning than we do with normal panning. Um, we cannot use a mode matching in here. I didn't check the conditioning, but I would expect it's very bad. So the mode matching would just blow our heads off. Um, and it's powerful DMP speakers, so I don't want to go that way. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a huge question, but it's now here, you know, when you go in a concert hall, it's not anechoic. You try, you equalize, but anyhow, you always perceptually come to a nice result somehow. Of course, you will not use ambisonics in the church. Or not for the reason of getting pan or so spatial pan, because that's not working. But in, in standard concert halls where you have 1.5, 1.6 seconds reverberation time, you get quite nice results. Although the positioning is not as accurate as it should maybe be. Can I ask uh, if you experimented with Doppler effects? No. I, mean, I just wondered but if the source was uh, on a pendulum and what was yeah, and yeah, 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 it would be. Listen to what the eigen mic could do relative to what you know is happening. Uh -huh. I mean, there you're, you're begging fish at recording. Uh -huh. No, that would be cool. I agree. Okay, let's do it. We have, <laughs> <laughs> we have no time. <laughs> yeah, hang it from the ceiling. Can you try one, um, one of these, uh, like the, the Amazon or the Woodline? Yeah, yeah, let's, let's maybe, the, the, I think the next one is my favorite, so. <laughs> so I definitely want to do favorite. this one. Uh, so we, there, we don't have to go through all four. The idea here was to show you a little bit um, how to correct for things. So this is in the barn again with a drum kit and an upright bass. So if you listen to the drum kit alone, you hear the, the upright bass faintly in, in, in the distance. So the idea was then to use the second eigen mic, which was somewhere in the room, to do a beam on the upright bass and use this basically as a spot mic to then mix this into the, the drum, so to emphasize a little bit the, the upright bass so you get a more equal level between the two of them. Okay, we go from beginning to final. Can I just ask, where is the center of the approximate sphere here? Is it Probably, yeah. <laughs> okay. Tell me, there are seats already taken. It's not, like, it's not like a little bit under the floor. I, I would be happy to have it. Because I, I, I see that, like, for, for example, this speaker is sort of angled such that... No, everyone is just getting up because otherwise it would be behind the wave filter. This is array. And the array would block the speaker. So the first one here is the, the eigen mic in the drum kit, which was actually upside down. So everything is, like, flipped over. 
And also this time there is deliberately sound coming from the top. So your snares and stuff is kind of the horizontal and then your drums are actually up there. And then the next one will be rotated, this, this thing. So we don't need to listen to that a whole lot, but just listen in a little bit. And then the third one is just the room eigen mic. And then we have the room eigen mic with a focus on the bass. And then the last one is the, the mix of the two. Upside down now. The first one was upside down, now it's correct. Yeah. So this one is the room mic only. This is the mic in the room. Which one? Is this the normal cardio? No, 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 it's an eigen mic. Oh, eigen mic, yeah. You're right in the middle. Yeah. So this is now, drum is there and... Bass is there. And now focus on the bass. Since it's a very reverberant space, there's lots of drums still coming in. And now the two together. This is just a different application, which I think is a wide, I think one of the more used cases for the eigen mic is to pick up ambient sound. So this is done an excerpt from a project called Eigenscape. And it's a database of acoustic scenes recorded spatially using the image acoustics eigen mic. All scenes were recorded in fourth order ambisonic ACN channel ordering, SM3D normalization. And this is, um, it's open on the web, so everybody has access to this. Uh, it's done by the University of, of York Audio Lab, and there's a link if you want to um, download some of that stuff. 
And this one then, for example, together with panoramics, but five, you have lots of stuff to experiment with. Also on our website, there are a few examples of what, you sh what you've seen today to give you some material to play with. Okay, so this, we, yeah. So the last one, um, David Monaki provided this one, and um, Marcus was explaining earlier. He is he has this project called Fragments of Extinction. So his um, idea is to to go in, into these endangered places to record the ecosystem, the sound soundscape in these endangered areas to preserve them, to archive them for for future generations. So this was in, in Ecuador. I think there was this area was threatened to be to be extinct because of oil drilling or something like it. And so he went there before that happened to, to record the ecosystem there. And so this is also an unaltered recording, so it's a one-to-one. -one. Um, lots of amphibians, insects, and, and some birds. Okay. All right. No, it's not loud enough. It's not loud enough, no. So actually there was, uh, I think it's funny, the question, um, if this recording was played back loud enough, and um, since I had the chance to work with David, um, the last three months, he told me that the level in the rainforest would be more yeah. wow. like this. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. And what's nice is you could now just do some beam steering. That's just beam forming into a direction. So. You can so this is what you said earlier, you do, to explore your sound field, to really look into so you look certain into directions. Sound field, there's a little wap. It's moving, I think there are more yeah, than one. It's, it's more than one. Yeah, yeah. Then you steer up. Somewhere here. Here, here we have it. We got him. <laughs> and so you, ex you extract the source from the channel we're recording. Or you damn the other one. It's a little bit unfair to listen into his private conversations. But, uh, <laughs> Shopping center might have been interested to focus a little bit. Okay. Right. So thank you very much for, uh, for staying to this long session. <laughs> <laughs>